Hi, I'm Vasilis Kostakis, Professor of Technology Governance and Sustainability. And today, I'm answering questions from the internet about technology, economics, and the future of our species. Here is the first question from the Infinity Scientist. Is technology good, bad, or neutral? Let me answer this with an analogy. Can John Rambo kill as easily with a butter knife as with his combat knife? Can Messi hit the crossbar as easily with a rugby ball as with a football? Technology is a neutral. It's ambivalent. Every tool enhances some capabilities and weakens others. The knife, the ball, your smartphone, they all shape what we can do. A Rambo with a common knife is terrifying. A Rambo with a smartphone, he would probably get stuck on TikTok. Think about it. A motorway is a neutral. It privileges cars over cyclists. Social media is a neutral. It privileges outrage over nuance. AI is a neutral. It privileges patterns from the past over alternative futures. Technologies and code choices about what matters, who benefits, and what kind of world we are building. So when economists tell us technology drives progress and we just need to adapt, they are hiding something crucial. Someone designed that technology, someone profits from it, and someone pays the cost. And this brings us to economics itself and our next question from Nick. How is economics even a science rather than just politics? So, is economics a science or politics? It's both, and that's exactly the problem. Economics wasn't always called economics. It used to be political economy, a name that was honest about power, distribution, ideologies, and ethics. Then it became just economics, as if dropping the word political made it more objective like uh, physics. But it didn't. For example, when Britain industrialized first, British economists championed free markets. When the US was developing, it protected its industries heavily. Then, once the US was on top, free trade everywhere, please. Now with China rising, protectionism is back in Washington. As Professor Eric Reinert put it, the free market is like boxing without weight categories. The heavyweights always win, and the rules change depending on who is winning. So, economics has scientific tools that can reveal genuine patterns. But when mainstream economists say the market demands austerity or free trade benefits everyone, they are making claims about whose interests matter and whose don't. Economics is scientific in its methods, but it is entangled with politics because it studies human choices in a world of scarcity, which is inherently about values and power. Artistic Hippo, a great nickname or an actual hippo, asks, is GDP a good measure for economic growth? GDP is useful for what it was designed to measure, the flow of market transactions through an economy. But here is what it misses and why that matters. GDP doesn't distinguish between building a hospital and cleaning an oil spill. Both count as growth. When an oil tanker crashes and devastates a coastline, GDP goes up. Someone has to clean it up, no? When you repair your shoes instead of buying new ones, GDP sees that as a missed opportunity. When we protect our oceans instead of mining them, it barely registers. GDP was never meant to measure well-being. We have made it the primary metric that drives policy decisions. What we measure shapes what we value. Right now, we are measuring how much stuff moves through the economy, not well-being, not ecological health, not whether people can actually live decent lives. The dominant GDP framework tends to treat the Earth's capacity as uh, infinite and environmental costs as someone else's problem. These costs get pushed onto the global south, onto future generations, onto ecosystems that cannot send us invoices. So what should we measure instead? Several researchers suggest focusing on well-being, ecological health, inequality, time with family, or access to healthcare and education. 
The question isn't whether GDP measures market activity accurately. It does. The question is, should market activity be our primary measure of progress when the planet is telling us it cannot sustain this model? A friend of mine is asking, why does my iPhone keep getting slower? Is that on purpose? Most of the time, yes. Apple admitted in 2017 that they deliberately slowed all their iPhones with updates. They paid a $113 million fine, which is pocket money for a trillion dollar company. And this isn't a bug, it's the business model. And it's not new either. Henry Ford made the same Model T for two decades. Black, durable, reliable. Then Alfred Sloan at General Motors said, new models every year, we will create demand. Planned obsolescence became the strategy. And here is a connection. When your iPhone slows down and you buy a new one, GDP goes up. Economic growth. Never mind the rare earth minerals mined, often by children in the global south. Never mind the e-waste shipped to Africa, where people burn circuit boards to extract copper, poisoning themselves and their water. None of that shows up onto the balance sheet. And that's not an accident. That's a feature. Your iPhone could be designed to last a decade. The software could be optimized for older hardware, but that would mean fewer sales, lower profits, less GDP growth, even though it would mean less waste, fewer emissions, and phones that actually serve you rather than just the shareholders. Technology is a neutral. It's designed with a system that rewards what Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction. The question is, who benefits from the creation and who pays for the destruction? On Reddit again, the user glittering neck is wondering, when energy production got more efficient, we didn't use less, we used more. Why will intelligence AI be any different? My dear glittering neck, it won't be. We have seen this film before. In 1865, economist Stanley Jevons noticed something strange. As steam engines became more efficient, Britain burned more coal, not less. Efficiency under capitalism means Cheaper production, which means more consumption, more profits. This is Chevron's paradox. Efficiency doesn't save resources under our dominant economic system. It just lets us consume them faster. Apply this to AI. If AI makes writing emails faster, we won't write fewer emails. We will write more. If AI allows you to produce more content, we will flood the internet with AI-generated content and training these models. Chat, GPT's training used as much electricity as a city uses in a year. The tech companies selling you AI don't pay for the emissions from data centers hitting the planet. Such costs get externalized, pushed onto communities, ecosystem, future generations. Jevons observed this dynamic in 1865. We are still seeing it play out in 2025. And that's not oversight. That's how the system is designed to function. David asks on Quora, do you believe technology is driving us towards dystopia in the future? History doesn't move in straight lines. Monarchy, revolution, empire, democracy, fascism, then democracy again, societies zigzag. The internet promised knowledge for all. Then came surveillance capitalism. Now AI threatens jobs. What's next? Open source AI democratic control of platforms. Historically, contradictions work themselves out. But here is why our era is different. We are running out of time. Previous generations could spend decades working through their contradictions. We don't have today that luxury. We need to halve emissions now. Biodiversity collapse is accelerating. Meanwhile, we are training AI models that consume as much electricity as entire cities. Is technology driving us towards dystopia? Under modern capitalism? Yes. Technology gets weaponized for uh, growth and profit maximization, externalities be damned. But could technology help us build something better? Absolutely. Renewable energy, localized food systems, electric public transportation, tools for cooperation, all possible. The question isn't whether technology can save or doom us, it's who controls it, for what purpose, and whether we have time before the system collapses. We are still zigzagging towards solutions. The problem is we are zigzagging on the Titanic, but at least we have Wi-Fi on a sinking ship. And perhaps 
This is your question. What is the answer, if any? What will save us? The problems we have discussed aren't bugs in the system. They are features. Planned obsolescence, GTP measuring distraction as growth, efficiency paradoxes, externalized costs. They are outcomes of how we have organized production and distribution. Individual choices alone won't save us. Recycling your iPhone won't stop ecological collapse. Buying an electric car won't fix a system designed for endless growth. We need structural change. But here is the good news. Another world is not just possible, it is necessary and the seeds of it already exist. Worker cooperatives where employees own and run their workplaces democratically. Community land trusts that take housing off the speculative market. Free and open source technologies that serve users and the planet. Renewable energy cooperatives owned by communities. Repair cafes where people fix things together instead of throwing them away. Community supported agriculture initiatives that produce their own food. These aren't utopian fantasies. They are functioning alternatives proving that we can organize production, knowledge and resources differently. The system that is harming us isn't inevitable. It is a choice, and we can choose differently. But only if we start building collective power to restructure how our economies work. Technology won't save us, but we might save ourselves if we take control of how technology is produced, designed, used. If you are interested in exploring these questions further, come study with us at the Ragnar Nuxe department in Estonia. My colleagues and I work on understanding and building these alternatives together.